All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's office hours. As always, let's make sure things are working. Maybe. Nice. Cool. I wonder what normal people do instead of just starting it and then immediately checking if it's working. Does everyone just trust that it works when they stream on Twitch? Maybe that's why I started doing. Worst case, I talk to myself for an hour. Um, all right, we got some number of people joining in to the Twitch chat. Let's go ahead and see what the heck is going on at 365 this week. All right, we are on access control. Well, look at this. I've solved seven levels. Due in two days, 12 hours, and 57 minutes. So this uh, module, I actually have less familiarity with this module. Every other module that is in this course, I either designed or helped design. Adam went rogue and deployed this module last semester. I guess he decided... Uh, that access control is an important topic that was not previously being taught. Well, it was being taught, and then I took over the course and stopped teaching it, because who really cares about access control? And then he decided it was important. Uh, so now we've got access control here, baked in to the Unix discretionary access control model. Um, uh, cool. Little known fact. I have never actually taken CSE 365. It's kind of fun. But when I attended ASU, 365 was not a required course uh, for computer science. And I never actually took it. So this means that I actually don't have a, a theoretical understanding of access control. I have a very applied understanding of access control. I have to make sure that the dojo is secure from an access control perspective. There's like all these fancy terms in here. Like, let's see here. Oh, do we not have slides? We got, there's all these weird, I don't know. People like to add theory to stuff. I mean, theory is, theory is useful, but at some point we got to chill a little bit here. What's going on here? Look, oh, I guess this would have been 2022. This one was last. All right, let's see. What the heck are even in these slides? What are these weird words? See, Unix. I know the Unix model. Okay, let's see here. The cool way we got variable names and stuff. Like, what the heck is this thing? I can tell you access control does not need to be this complicated. What the heck? Subjects, objects, rights. All right, as soon as you start seeing theory, you get nervous because someone's decided that they want to formalize something. It's never a good idea when someone decides they want to formalize something. It means they're trying to hide something from you. That's not true. But uh, truly, I don't have a good uh, theoretical understanding of access control, but I am ready and happy to talk about this model module. Um, ACL, subject-centric approach. See, it's cap. It's all cap here. Capabilities, tokens. See, something we want to do, I mean, unfortunately for you, you're in this semester's version of the class, but a thing, an idea we have about a future version of this class, we might actually explore um, the Windows access control model, because it turns out that Windows just looks fundamentally different than Linux for how it handles the, the idea of access control. Um, I think under this like theoretical model, like don't quote me on this one. I think on this, well, authentication of subject. I know that Windows is very subjects heavy. Let's say that. ACL, object centric authentication. Does that mean Linux is ACL E? 
Probably. All right, here we go. Can we go over how to calculate if a subject has access given certain levels and categories as is done in the challenge binaries for 17, 18, and 19? Absolutely, let's do it. Okay. So, okay, so part of this, okay, I got a question for you um, to answer your question. Are you looking at this more, This is this question coming from that theoretical understanding of how to calculate? Or is this question more a scripting question? Because we have this like whole in one second. Um, is it, yes, yeah, so is this a programmatic issue? Like how do we actually answer 128 questions that are dynamically created in one second? Or is this like a, no, what is the actual theoretical underpinning? How do I figure out the answer? Like, could you have solved this if you had 10 hours to do this? Um, specifically for scripting. Uh, more, more like, how do we find, I'm not really concerned. Okay. Specifically. Oh, wait, I feel like this says you want scripting, but then this says you don't care about scripting. A little bit confused. Um, okay, this person says read and write. I found that subsets were useful. Let's okay. Let's go ahead and just start up seventeen. See what the heck is going on here. Okay, you're interested more theoretically. All right. Let's let's see what these questions are. Um, yeah, we'll do VS Code. This was us talking about crypto stuff. Don't care about that anymore. Don't care about that. Get rid of this thing. PS1 equals that. Clear. Challenge. Let's, let's see what the heck is going on. Boom. Alarm clock. Look at that. One second. We didn't even have a chance to read the first question. What is this? Okay. I'm just going to like copy and paste this into a text editor in case it feels nice. Okay. Uh, so again, full disclosure, I am actually approaching this right now, having never seen this challenge before. So hopefully I don't lead you astray. In this series of challenges, you will be working with various access control systems. Break the system to get the flag. In this challenge, you'll be answering many questions about the category-based Bell Lapad doula model of mandatory access control. See this, as soon as you got systems named after people, it's, it's terrifying. Then we're getting theory. Okay, category based. So we got something to do with categories, something to do with these people, mandatory access control. Okay. In this challenge, your goal is to answer 20 questions correctly in one second about the following mandatory access control MAC system. Uh, four levels. First is highest, aka more sensitive. Okay, so I'm familiar, I believe, with this. I believe this is something like top secret, secret, classified, unclassified. Okay, so I'm going to, we're, we're a little bit nervous about leading you all astray here, but, okay, so it says highest, aka, okay, so like top secret's the most sensitive, unclassified, the least sensitive, Okay, let's see here. Um, okay, we got four categories though also. Okay, can a subject with level C, okay, level so classified and categories, UFO, NATO, read an object with level C and categories UFO, ACE. Okay. Yeah, this, this seems like a, uh, an excellent decision. I opened the wiki page for Bell Padula back when I sold this, and there was only one section of that article that was actually helpful. Okay. Okay. Well, let's actually just do that. Okay. Model defines one discretionary access control rule and two 
mandatory access control rules with three security properties. Um, okay, so these are the properties. These are basically the rules that we're going to need to follow when we think about this. So the simple security property states that a subject at a given security level may not read an object at a higher security level. Okay, so the security level, this is our um, security levels. So we have a sub, so we kind of got two things here. We got objects, we got subjects. Okay, let's actually even copy these things so we can reason about it in a text editor. Do your word wrap thing, VS Code. Word wrap, cool. This, this, oh, there's a camera here. We'll do that. Hopefully, let's, we'll double check here that our camera is now not blocking this text. All right, sweet, looks good. I think we can even go up one, right? Camera is now not blocking oh boy, text. we gotta mute ourselves. All right, that looks good. All right, cool. Line five is where we can go to. The simple security property states that a subject at a given security level may not read an object at a higher security level. Okay, so at a given security level, okay, so this means objects. So this implies to us that objects and subjects exist. Objects have security levels. Subjects have security levels, right? These are it follows from this that an object must have a security level, a subject must have a security level. Um, subject at a given security level may not read an object at a higher security level. Okay, so we have a subject at top secret. I have, or let's say I have, hold on here. Um, a subject at a okay, so let's pretend, for example, I have an object at top secret. I have a subject at secret. This person here that's at secret, the subject at secret cannot read any object at top secret. Probably if we're thinking about like our mental understanding of, you know, if you've heard top secret, secret, that sort of thing before, probably that just makes sense. Okay. Have security levels. Okay. And then we'll specifically say can not read up. Okay. The star security property states that a subject at a given security level may not write to any sub object to any object at a lower security level. Can not write down. Okay, so we cannot read up, we cannot write down. We can kind of think about this if we uh, consider like maybe why would we design a system like this? Well, okay, we're theorizing here, we're uh, making a theoretical framework. Probably this has something to do with the fact that a subject should not be able to leak information. So for example, if I am a subject at secret and I can read uh, some object at secret, if I could write to classified, then I could leak information down, right? So I, then if, if I basically just copy and paste an object at secret into classified, right? That would be transferring information down. And now someone that's at classified is effectively reading something at secret when they should only be able to read classified. So we can't write down, otherwise we can leak information. Now, obviously you can think about this as like, well, just don't do that. But we're trying to design this theoretical system that is like unbreakable. If we, if we have this property, okay, we're unbreakable, at least as far as that concern is here. Okay, the discretionary security property Okay, whoa, that's a word. Discretionary security property uses an access matrix to specify the discretionary access control. Okay, I have no idea what the heck that one means. Back to the Wikipedia. Uh, the transfer of information from a high sensitivity document to a low sensitivity may happen. Okay, the concept of trusted subjects are not restricted by the, okay, so we do have a like back door in this or like some way to escape this because you might wanna like declassify information or something. This talks about, hey, well, we might want to loosen that up a little bit. Trusted subjects are not restricted. So trusted subjects, I guess, just don't have to follow this thing. Uh, trusted subjects must be shown to be trustworthy with regard to the security. Okay, so it's like, if we got this magical subject person that we know we can trust, all right, fine, we can give them special exceptions to this rule. 
Uh, Skew is directed towards access control. Yeah, so as I said, I think I've heard this, this concept before. We can write up um, and read down, exactly. Whereas the, yeah, we can write up, we can read down. Uh, okay, cool. Users can create content only at or above their own security level. Um, that, 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 do not, okay, follow, do not treat the following extensively. Um, describe network of systems, okay, cool, 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 cool. Okay. Yeah, we'll talk about Python stuff um, here as well. Okay, so back to our questions. We also have these categories. Okay, what's going on here with categories? Oh, I guess we need category based bell, blah, 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 blah. When in doubt, go to the slides. Okay, hold on, what do we have? Okay, we got these. What the heck is this? Oh, well, we got UFO stuff, I see. Not a good search term. Something tells me we're about to be going to part two. Oh boy. Okay, blah, 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 blah. Oh, we got something that was related here. Well, I, every time I run this, is this changing? I think labor level stuff in the world, but UFO NATO, UFO ACE. Yeah, this changes every time, but we've got only these four categories. Okay. Categories. Security levels are too coarse grain. Categories. Canada Ace. Need to know basis for assigning categories to subjects. How to define the security policy now. Okay, this is a good question. This is the question we need to answer. A subject's security level, an object's security level is now LC, where L is the level and C is the set of categories. Okay, so we have a set of categories. How to compare S1 with object L1 for access? Okay, probably on a read basis and a write basis. We'll see if those are the same or not the same. See, this is the nice, this is the cool part about theoretical stuff, right? Is you can just like define this, like kind of in a mathematical sense and then just let it play out. Um, the question is, where are our definitions here? Give me my definitions so that I can follow out your rules. Oh, what the heck is this? We got a lattice, more math stuff. The people love their math stuff. Believe me, as soon as you see all like lattice and stuff, it's like, okay, they guarantee it's gonna be simpler than on first impression. It's just formalizing. It's making it well-defined, it's well-defined structured object properties. In reality, you apply this thing, it's gonna be a lot simpler. You're gonna be like, wow, that's like two lines of Python. Would have been better to see the Python than to see the lattice. But we're looking at the lattice. Okay, so we've got some lattice things. So we've got like, and we're just gonna assume each of these things is its own discrete thing that doesn't have properties other than being a discrete thing. We have four different things, a set of four things, for example, this is a, a subset of three of those four things. Follows down this way, and then I guess we're just getting smaller and smaller and smaller. NATO has this and this, which makes sense. NATO, yeah, so it's just saying, okay, this is my. These are all my subsets, right? Size two, I'm decreasing by one. We got this subset, and probably you know you just follow the chain all the way down, and you're just finding all of your subsets. 
right? This, yeah, hopefully, I think we all understand. It's just removing one element. These are the three options. If you remove one element from a set of three, there's three options of which basically you pick which one you want to remove. You got two things, well, you got two options of what are you going to remove. Uh, you got one thing, well, you got one option. You can remove one thing. Okay. Cool, 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 cool. Oh boy. We love the if with a bonus F. That means it goes both directions. For those that do not understand math, if with an extra F means it goes both directions. The precondition defines the, you know, you just, we'll see, we'll see. It'll make sense. Don't worry, nobody panic. Uh, security level LC dominates security level L prime, C prime, if L prime is a less than or equal to. So this L is our level thing. So that goes back to top secret, secret, classified, unclassified. And uh, C prime needs to be a, uh, a subset, not a strict subset, as in like definitely has to be smaller, it can also be equal, equivalent, or it needs to be a subset. So C prime needs to be a subset. Um, and then it dominates. Okay, and then dominate has basically, uh, in the same way that one is read up, right? We have kind of, this is inverted, right? You can read, cannot read up as in, can read down, right? This is written the other way, can write up. And then at the same level, it's also always fine. So in the same way that read, it goes the opposite direction of write, um, it looks like this subset stuff goes the opposite direction. So uh, um, maybe we just define, this as dominates, and then we pick S dom O or O dom S, depending on which direction we're going. Okay, so what this means is, um, L prime is less than, um, uh, and C prime is, is a subset of C. So I think what this means here is, okay, let's actually just take our example. That way we work with that and then we'll make sure we understand it here. So I have UFO and NATO. Now the question is, is this a subset or not? It is not a subset, right? ACE is not in here. Um, Neither is a subset of the other, right? Like this is just two totally disjoint sets, right? That's kind of maybe one way of thinking about this is that the intersection of these things, I don't even know, I guess the Python notation for intersection would be an ampersand. Um, UFO uh, and NATO, oops, ampersand this, um, is the empty set. Well, no, that's not true. There's a UFO in it. Um, but the, the, I guess what's the way to talk about this? Um, what would be the mathematical way that you show that these two things eh, we don't need to do that either way these do not dominate right this is um can a subject with level c in categories ufo nato read an object with level c in categories ufo ace Okay, so it could read in which direction? I see it's because the categories in the script are defined by bits. Yeah, there are, yeah. Um, okay, so so, okay, so going back to this thing, let's just like say, does it dominate the security level? Okay, so we have L and C. So L is equal, so we're talking about the subject. Okay, so L is equal to C. Um, C is equal to 
this thing right here. L prime is equal to C. L, uh, C prime is equal to this. Okay, so now the question is, does S dominate O? Um, well, that would say, so we're good on this L prime less than or equal to L. So L prime less than or equal to L true, right? Uh, because, well, hold on first. Let's write out what we're about to do. How do we, we'll just write also as less than or equal to to define subset uh, C. Okay, so this one would be saying is C less than or equal to C true. Okay, um, this is confusing because this is different meaning. Okay, so here's what we're gonna say. We're gonna redefine everything here to be the lowercase. If you are a thing over here, you are now lowercase. Less confusing, hopefully. Okay, C is less than or equal to C. That's true, they're equal to each other, right? So this is true. Now, if we look at this thing, the question is, is this thing, well, actually specifically this thing, uh, less than or equal to this thing. And this is false, right? This is not a subset of this. This guy is not a subset of this guy because ace does not appear in here, right? We would need um, this. If this was ace, then it would be true, but it's not. We're missing that ace element. Alternatively, if it was this, this would also then become true because okay, we, we all know how subsets work, right? Um, okay, so this says then for that first property of S dom O, S dom O is a no. So that means the subject, um, so we're using our L and our C are our subject, our L prime and our C prime are our object. Probably we could get away from single letter variable names here. The whole math thing is not doing it for us because what the heck is prime, but this thing cannot read, okay? But can it write? That's the next question. Subject can not read. Okay, the next question is basically invert L and L prime and C and C prime. So L this time, well, it turns out it's still C. L equals C. Um, C equals, well, what C prime was, right? This thing, the, the second dude, what the objects thing is. Um, and then, uh, okay, I feel like the way I'm writing this out is terrible. Let's do instead, we'll call it subject L, subject C, object L, object C. Look at how much more readable this is, right? This prime stuff is no good. Okay, so then the question was before, is object L less than or equal to subject L? And the answer was yes. And then the question was, object C less than or uh, equal to subject C. And the answer here was false. You need both to be true. It's gotta be dominated and domination pro uh, property requires an and. It's gotta be both of them. So no, okay. So um, subject dom object is a no. Subject cannot read. Okay, now back to this. Well, it turns out now we can just copy and paste this thing. Uh, but now we want to go in the other direction. Did the object dominate S? And so if L O is going in as the first guy, it's, you know, we're about to invert everything. So the question now is, does subject F, uh, 
uh, less than or equal to object L. And it turns out, well, yeah, it still C is less than or equal to C, so that is true. But now we're about to say, does subject C less than or equal to object C? And the question there now uh, is this guy, our subject portion and our object portion. And this is still false, right? We would need to either remove NATO or add NATO here, right? This is false. These are not sub, uh, subsets. Okay, so then finally to answer this question after looking at this for a bit, but now we kind of understand what's going on, is the answer is just no. Let's make sure we uh, keep up with this. Cool. Okay, now let's write a script that can just answer one of these questions, right? Or here's what we're going to do, actually. We're not going to write a script um, quite yet, at least. Maybe we will eventually. Uh, what we're going to do instead um, is modify sudo chmod777 challenge run. Let's challenge run. Okay, now what we're going to do is open challenge run here. Something, so we're on what, level 17? Okay, I'm guessing this is our timeout max. We're going to modify the challenge to get rid of this law or this super quick timeout so that we can confirm without even having to script that we've got this understood correctly, right? Where the heck is, who's defined? I got death max challenge, okay. Um, what the heck is this? This, okay, we're just gonna get rid of that. No more doing that. Okay, challenge run. Okay, now it fails, wonderful. Who wrote this code? Someone's trying to read the flag and it's probably crashing. Oh, I know what it is actually. It's this guy is not happy. Okay, we're just gonna switch this also to user bin and Python. Okay, now it can't read the flag, but it can do things and hang out for a while. Okay, so here's our question. Subject with level UC and object with level UC. Okay, so for if it's gonna be subject UC and level UC, well, they're the same thing, which means it, it that portion of the dominates thing, it's at the equivalent level, so it doesn't matter which direction, it's always equal to, so that means it's both less than or equal to and greater than or equal to is, is true. So then here's the question. We want to say right here, this is our question. Oops. This is our question. Okay. So we're going to ignore the L portion of this. They're equal to each other. Whether we're reading or writing, the level portion is figured out. The category portion, though, um, let's see here. S can read O if S dom O. So, but the question is, can it write? So then we want to know uh, if O dom S. So the object um, I think the way this is written is okay, here's what we're going to say. We're going to define I am sick of looking at this math notation. Uh, death dominates A, B, or we'll just say dom. Okay. So dominate is, I think I saw people talking about it in the chat, new terminal. If we want to use, uh, sets in Python, so I can say, for example, A is equal to one, two, three, B is equal to two, three, four, 
Okay, and then we can say A and B. So this is the intersection, right, intersection. This would be the union, right, union. Hopefully that's lining up with everyone's understanding of sets. Um, and then I believe we can also do this. So this is saying, is it a strict subset? This is saying, is it a subset? Um, we could also go this direction to say, is it a superset? Or a strict superset, this would be saying, is it a superset? Strict just means not also equal to. So strict means have to be more elements, right? They can't be the same number of elements. Like it's got to actually be, uh, yeah, okay. So, so if we want to say that something dominates, going back to this slide right here, um, Well, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to say L, C, how are we going to write prime? L prime, C prime, that's good enough. Um, and then we're going to return L has to be, or L prime has to be greater than or less than or equal to L and c prime has to be less than or equal to c right this is our, we're writing prime this is how we define power i here okay and now python can just do this work right given l c l prime and c prime l prime less than or equal to l c prime less than or equal to c let's um write another function that kind of this is like the mathematical definition. Let's move this into the world of, um, we'll say can read, and we'll take in a subject and an object. Hopefully Python's not gonna complain about that. I don't think it will. In fact, we're gonna do that, that. Okay, so we're going to assume that subject is a tuple, so hold on. So for example, subject, we might say can read, um, and we would pass for example, um, I mean, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of ways we could write something like this out. Uh, we could take all of these things and basically just make them integers, this being the highest, right? We could do something like that. And then uh, we could do sets for this as well. Let's, we'll do sets. You could do like bitwise stuff also. I think someone was talking about that in the chat, but we can also just make sure each thing is a unique number and then we can throw it in a set. And then we could be something like can read, and we might pass something like, if we look at this example, uc, comma, any uc. And this would now, we're about to create valid Python. In fact, I'm about to switch just straight over to Python. Let's do that. Let's switch to Python. Okay, we need to also pass an object is what Python just told us. We would also be passing another tuple. So this is going to be something like um, our object, which is uc and then this. So uc and this. Cool. Um, uh, and then we'll just print, can read. Well, right now we're always returning none. Okay, so what is our definition of can read? So it can read, a subject can read an object if s dom o. So if s dom o. So dom s dom o. So s would be, so for example, we're going to have subject l, comma, subject C equals subject, so that's how you unpack a tuple in Python. 
and we'll have like object L, object C equals our object. Then the question is S DOM O. So we put in, we're passing in our subject stuff first, right? This is the first parameter. S, second parameter will be our O. So we will pass subject L, subject C, object L, object O. And we will return DOM. Okay, so now this is going to tell us, can it read? Oops, someone's not happy. Subject C. This says we cannot read. Okay. Let's see, is that true? False. Well, we're supposed to say yes or no. Now we know. Uh, can a subject with level S, okay. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take this, throw that off to the side here. Let's say, subject equals equals s comma this thing object equals s comma this thing and then what we want to know is can read subject object This says true. So if we put in yes, do we write it correct? Okay, it says yes. Well, guess what? We could just keep running this and swapping out our things. Right, we're doing this by hand. Obviously, we're going to be scripting this ultimately, or you will be scripting this ultimately. And this guy is TS, this, this, this. This says false, no, correct. Okay, and then we just keep going, right? It's, this is the nice thing about formalizing things for those wondering. So you can just translate it into code, right? We just took this thing and uh, I mean, we defined the can read. So if we go back to this, um, we defined can read as a function of DOM, right? So we pass in a subject, we pass in an object, Unpack it. This is just Pythonism rather than formal mathematical stuff. Um, we unpacked it. And then it just says that you can read if s dom o. And dom is really just a function with four parameters. You could think of it as a function really with two parameters. So, for example, maybe that would uh, feel better to you. Uh, maybe we would say, like, this is lc and L prime C prime, for example. Uh, and then we would say LC equals LC, L prime C prime equals L prime C prime, right? We just unpack this thing. And then we don't need to unpack here. Instead, we just say subject object, right? Maybe this is better for you because you know what? Kind of when we're writing this mathematically, we can see that the function DOM, right? Function, DOM is just a function. It's a function that's doing um, Boolean, just Boolean logic, okay? And it takes in two things. It takes in this thing, which is a tuple of LC, and it takes in this thing, which is a tuple of L prime C prime, right? So it takes two parameters. And each parameter is composed of a tuple, is a tuple of, two things, so this is where we unpack it. Right, we unpack that tuple. Uh, and then it just says that if L prime is less than or equal to L, L prime less than or equal to L, and C prime less than or equal to C. Now the nice thing is that Python, if we use sets as we're using here, and we're just making sure each thing is a discrete thing within the set, of course, if we said that UFO and NATO were both equal to one, our set logic wouldn't work. Each of these needs to be its own unique thing. You can imagine if you wanna make this even cleaner code, you could use something like an enum. Python has enums as well. Um, 
And then this, we just need to make sure that it follows the hierarchical nature that TS is greater than S, which is greater than C, which is greater than UC. For, fortunately, we can just take four integers of greater and greater values to define that relationship in the world of integers. And read is just a function that applies the DOM function, right? So we just, uh, this is kind of like, we get abstraction here because we define what DOM is. So now the can read, aka the simple security condition is just, does the subject dominate the object, okay? Turns out that the can write, it's very easy to, to write that as well, can write, if we're curious, says that does O DOM S, as in make O be the first argument, make S be the second argument, and write given a subject and an object would be return DOM object subject. We just go the other way, right? Now we can start asking these questions, giving ourselves a subject and an object. Can it read? No. Can it write? Also no, right? For this set of things, you can neither read nor write. Okay, does anyone have any questions about this? Holy is like one of the more straightforward modules, even though it's like we've mathematically formalized this stuff and probably that gets in the way of some things. It's really not that difficult. Hopefully, hopefully we agree with that. If it's not, it's fine. Please, please feel free to ask. Okay, so something that someone is talking about here, I see because categories in the script are defined by bits. So that's just an implementation detail. So in this case, we're using a set, right? This thing is the same thing as the set of two and three. This thing is, oops, is the set of one and two. So it turns out that sets can also, instead of defining them as like Python sets, you can use a basically a bit set um, or a bit field is really the more common name for that. And what we would do if we wanted to define that is, um, in fact, let's just, well, yeah, here's what we'll say. So before we had UFO equals one, NATO equals two equals three, ace equals four, right? And we would create these sets like this. Well, instead you could kind of think of this as the index into a bit field as being set to one or zero. And what I mean by that is that we could say that instead that UFO is one, uh, shifted over by one, NATO could be one shifted over by two, Nook could be one shifted over by three, and Ace could be one shifted over by four. And you'll notice this now is all powers of two, UFO, NATO, Nook, Ace. And what we can do now is we could say something like uh, UFO or NATO or Nook or Ace. This is how we would do uh, the definition of this thing rather than using Python set notation, we would or these things together. And if we look at this as like binary bits, right? We have this bit set, this bit set, this bit set, this bit set. We're being inefficient. We're not using the, the zeroth bit. Really how you would do this is this would be zero, this would be one, this would be two, this would be three. Start with zero indexing. And then if we look at this, right? All four bits are set. We could turn NATO off. And now it's one, one, zero, one. We could turn another guy off, one, zero, zero, one. And this is the same idea as a set. And now what we can do is we can be like UFO or ACE, this set thing. Uh, let's go ahead and intersect it, uh, intersect it with UFO or Nook. If we think about this, right, what are we expecting if we intersect these two sets? We're expecting only UFO to remain. If we look at this, this is a one, UFO is a one. So all that remains is UFO. Alternatively, if we add an ace here, expecting UFO and ace to be there, UFO, UFO and ace, uh, this, right, is just, oops, nope, that's not right, there we go. This is a nine also, UFO or ace. It's just another way to do sets, you can do it with integers. It's like mathematically the same thing. 
All right, any more questions about this? Hold is like, it's probably answering some questions here, right? We just define things, run it. Next thing you do is use pwn tools um, to extract out this, convert that into that, extract out this, convert it, right? Convert the English sentence into uh, these Python objects to run it through your checker and then return yes or no. And then just do that really fast. All right, any final questions? Otherwise, I'm going to wrap this one up uh, earlier. Will you go over automating how to answer one question? All right, fine, 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 fine. So this is like an exercise in, in regex, really. So here's what I would do. We don't even need pwn tools, right? Let's, let's not make this scarier than it needs to be. Like, honestly, pwn tools makes it easier. But I'm going to show you more idiomatic Python. So if we do import subprocess and we say subprocess uh, process equals subprocess key open. Okay, just roll with me for a second here on this one. Challenge run. Okay, well, you'll see that that was basically the same thing as in my shell. If I had just run challenge run, it all appears here. Okay, we don't want that. Oh boy, we just destroyed something. How can I not exit out of this? Hold on. Yep. Challenge. Kill this process. What? I want this process die. Oh, there we go. Okay. It appeared all on standard out. We don't want this, right? What we want is really like a string of this in Python. So we can manipulate this as a string in Python. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to say that standard out is going to subprocess.pipe. And you will see now that I have this. Oh, no, messed something else up. One second. Hold on. Here I was trying to say, look how easy this is. I'm making mistake after mistake after mistake. Okay. We also, well, one more thing. The reason that IPython like was hanging and was being weird is also my terminal was automatically being the standard in to challenge run. We want standard in and standard out to not go through my uh, terminal. I want it to go through this Python object. Okay, so we do this now. And now I can see I have this process object. Okay, so we've constructed this. In fact, let me even maybe make this slightly easier to read because of how large this text all is. Hold on. Let's say this. Nice and readable with large text, right? We pass the program. We're saying, hey, I want, basically what I'm saying here is I want Python to be manipulating the input to this program and Python to be interacting with the output of this program. Basically, it's all going over a pipe um, rather than straight at our terminal object. If you're curious about this, right, so this process has a PID. So I could, for example, look at this process as we did in what, building a web server or something, we inspected a process. You'll see that zero and one are now pointing at this pipe or these two separate pipes. Two, our standard error is still pointing at the terminal. In this case, I mean, we could also redirect standard error if we wanted to, but we're kind of just gonna assume nothing's gonna speak on standard error. Okay, so I have this process object now. And what I can do with this process object is read. So for example, if I read, a thousand, hex a thousand bytes. Let's just do, let's not get weird. Let's just say a thousand bytes. Nope, not true. If I do process.standardout.read a thousand bytes, well, it just sits there and hangs. 
Because guess what? There's not a thousand bytes to read. So it's sitting here waiting to read exactly a thousand bytes. This is no good. Uh, I believe what we can do is say also read line. This will give us, I think we killed the program because of how we just did that. Hold on. Uh, if we do this again, read the line, right? So now okay, here we go. Maybe we're happier with this. We can see we have this thing right here. That's the first line. Here's another line. Here's the next line, another line, another line, another line, another line, another line. Just keep going, right? All these lines uh, as if we were to have run the program itself, right? Each one coming on a single line at a time. Great. Um, what we don't like though about this maybe is uh, that this is a byte string. So this isn't a normal string, this is a byte string. Don't worry, I believe we can just say encoding equals Latin. Latin is just our friendly encoding that all zero through 255 values of a byte can decode to the Latin encoding. Just roll with it. If we did ASCII, this part right here would fail because this is not ASCII right here. E2 is not an ASCII thing. That's how we get that accented E. Um, because of Unicode, but we don't care about that. Well, you know what? We could even say, who cares? Well, let's say UTF-8. It's encoding UTF-8. We won't even worry about the Latin thing. It's UTF-8. This is how we can encode UTF-8. We'll say that the encoding is UTF-8. And so now if I do this again, now it comes back as a string instead of a byte string, maybe kind of nicer to work with. Sometimes you might want a byte string though. And now we'll see that we got, oh, I guess it was the hyphen that was being weird, right? So this right here is a weird hyphen, which is not ASCII. It's not the ASCII hyphen, it's a like longer hyphen or something. Um, and anyways, now these are strings. Okay, so what can we do? Well, we can say, while true, or I mean, yeah, we'll just say while true, think about writing Python however the heck you wanna write Python. We'll say that this is the line. And then what do we want to do? Well, we're writing Python. Let's just wait until we see the line has can a subject with, um, or we could even see does the line start with Q space? Maybe we want to use that as our condition for like, all right, let's get ready to start doing something. We're kind of assuming here that each question will have a Q space. If I say yes, right, then it says correct Q space. Okay, Q space. If um, line starts with Q space, we're just converting the logic in our head for the program we're trying to write into Python. If line starts with Q space, um, let's invert that and say if it doesn't start with Q space, continue, right? We're gonna read another line. Otherwise, it starts with a Q space, let's do something. Okay, what we're gonna do is in this case, we'll just start simple, we're gonna print that line. Okay, boom. Can a subject with level TS in categories blah write an object with level TS in categories blah? Cool, cool, cool. So now we gotta parse this thing. Think back to building a web server, HTTP, we gotta parse something, parse this however we want. If we wanna write assembly to parse this thing, we could write assembly to write parse this thing. We're not gonna do that though, because that would be crazy. You could, for example, read, we could like find where level space is in here. So for example, we have this line object. We could split on level space, and you'll see that now this string has been split into three parts, right? We have Q1, can a subject with space, and then we split on level space. TS in category blah, 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 right? You can imagine like picking the first or the one thing of this, and then splitting on space and grabbing the zero thing, right? Look at this, now we've isolated TS. This is certainly a path that you can go towards for parsing and it works. I do this all the time, honestly. Some, it's just, there's times where parsing like this and just the dumb approach of parsing things, it just works. Um, really kind of the more appropriate way to parse something like this would be with regex. So if we import regex and we want to say 
we dot um, match. And what are we going to be matching on? Okay, well, first question is, does this match our line? No, wait, what did I do wrong? Um, I think... um... Read dot match. So this is our pattern. I think these curly braces are regex things. So I think if I put a backslash here and a backslash here, backslash here. Backslash here. No, that still doesn't match. Do I need a backslash here? Here's the issue with regex. So you gotta figure out how the heck to make it good. Okay, finally we got it. Um, okay, so this regex now, which is slightly different than the original string, matches the original string, right? The issue is this is a regex character. This is a regex character. Regex character, regex character, regex character. And you put a backslash in front of it, it basically says, um, give me the um, non-regex character version of this. I mean, like, actually a curly base. And normally you would put an R here to make sure that these, there's a world in which, like, backslash curly brace actually decodes to something else because we're in Python. The safe thing to do is just to put an R here. Um, which means like backslashes, keep the bat black slash in. Yeah, here, let me, well, yeah, okay, roll with this. Okay, so now what we want to do is we know that the question is going to be not just necessarily a one, it's going to be one or more digits, okay? Similarly, this is going to be, um, one or more word characters. Um, this is how I would write this, okay? Um, or here's what else we can do. If we're, if we're worried about like, what the heck does backslash D mean? We can say that this is going to be characters zero through nine, one or more of them. This is going to be characters A through Z, one or more of them. Inside of these curly braces, this is very sad that this is at the end of the line here, um, but this is going to be characters A through Z or a comma or a space and one or more of them, right? That'll capture all of our uppercase characters, commas, spaces, good to go. That's what we're trying to match in there. Um, this will be characters A through Z. This will be characters, again, A through Z and a comma and a space, one or more of them. And this still matches. Now, if we want to isolate this, we put this in parentheses. So if we look at this, now we're going to capture that thing. And if I say group zero, excuse me, if I say group one, you'll see that this is this thing. Group one is this thing. There is no group two. We didn't set up another capture group. If I put this thing now in parentheses, this will go to capture group two. Look at this, capture group two is now TS. If I put this thing in parentheses, we're thinking about what do we want to capture? We want to capture this. We want to capture this, and we want to capture this. Okay, this is a very normal way of parsing things. So now we've got the question number, the level of the subject, the group of the subject, we have to further parse that, uh, the object level, and the object categories, and that's all we care about. So now what we're going to do is I do groups that, yeah. So we can take this, 
Um, we want this, we want this. Actually, let's keep rolling. We'll say groups, and we're going to say the question, the subject level, the, well, okay, there's, we'll say that this thing is a match, match groups, okay, we'll say this, question equals match groups zero, um, subject level equals match groups one, right? We could keep writing this out. That's one option, or we could do what I was doing before and do question, subject level, subject categories, object level, object categories equals this thing. Now we have a question, a subject level, a subject categories, a object level, and object categories, and that's pretty cool. Uh, we need to further parse this out. Maybe we want question to be an int, so we say question equals int question. Um, if we think way back here, we might say something like, where was this? This stuff, okay, what do we have? TS, we could say like levels equals a dictionary of TS is four, S is three, what else do we have? C is two, UC is one. And we could also say something like categories equals this. Basically, so we can translate strings back into their numbers. NATO can be one. UFO can be two. And you see can be three and ace can be four. Okay, so now we can get ready to translate into numbers. So subject level equals levels of subject level, right? So we're gonna pass something like TS into this dictionary and a four is gonna come out. Look at this, subject level is now a four, which makes sense because TS was right here and now a four is popping out. Hey, object, uh, subject, well, yeah, we'll say object level also equals levels object level. Translate that into an integer. Now, this gets our levels, this gets our questions. We're still needing to deal with subject categories. This needs further parsing. Here's what we're gonna do. We're just gonna split on comma space, okay? And we could even now turn this into a set. And we could say for E in this set, so this would be E for E in this set, it's the same thing, right? It's E for E in this thing. The next thing though we do is we say categories sub E. And you'll see now we've translated it in. This is how you do it in Python. It's like taking, like, only it's clear in your mind like what you want to do to deconstruct this string. And then this is like a matter of translating that into Python. This is kind of like the standard way you might translate that into Python. And now we have subject categories equals blah. And we'll say object categories equals blah, but fix this to object. And now I take my history, grab this for uh, while true, I'm hitting control R to reverse search through IPython. Do this however you want. You can just type this all out in a text editor. Okay, that goes there, that goes there, that goes there, that goes there, that goes there. Okay, now we can say, oops. Now we can say that our subject is equal to our subject level subject 
categories and our object or and our object is equal to our object level and object categories. Now I can just like, for example, print my subject and my object, right? So that printed that. Um, and maybe we also print the question number. Um, right now, we'll just keep assuming everything is right. We might need to parse this part out also. If at some point a future question is no longer only about right and asks the read question, well, we're going to need to parse that. Hopefully it's clear how you might do that. I'm going to leave that up to you. Right now, we're just going to keep assuming it's a right question. And then we can ask, can right subject object, right? Actually, let's print this, print this. Oh, we lost our can right. Where the heck did that go? Where did you go, can right? I seem to have lost it. That is so sad. Well, I'm going to leave that as an exercise to you. Um, right now, I'm just going to print the object. Oops. Well, it looks like sometimes it doesn't parse. We do percent debug. We can print out the line. Yeah, see, sometimes it asks read. OK, ultimately, though, we're going to figure out the answer, and in this case, I'm just going to say the answer is no and show you how we can do process standard in write answer uh, plus a new line character because probably we need a new line character for this program to understand what the heck we just said. Um, and we will. We will then also read one more line just to see whether we got it right or not. Standard out dot read line if we want to. Result equals that. Print result. Okay, that was must have been a read question. Couldn't parse it. That must have been a read question. Couldn't parse it. A read question. Hmm. Why do we not see the result? What happens if I say yes? See, it says correct. If I say no, incorrect, where is my result? We might have needed to flush this also. Standard in dot flush, maybe. See, yeah, we needed that, and then it says incorrect. Sometimes we'll be correct. See, this one was correct, and then it went on to the next question. Looks like the next next question must have been a read. Change your regex to make it handle read. Do the thing we were talking about before to figure out if it's correct, etc. All right, hope well, I got you set on your path. Yeah, I mean, so basically, the, the, see, mind being blown with regex. Yeah, regex is very useful for parsing. Now, I don't know if you're currently in CSE 355. I think it's 355 that talks about like state machines, Turing machines, context-free grammars, blah, 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 blah. Something that there's a, there's a, that's a very theoretical class, 355. And one of the theoretical takeaways that will come from that class that is not necessarily, I mean, it's very clearly stated in that class, but maybe isn't connected to the practical sense, is that not everything can be parsed with a regular expression, okay? Certain things can be parsed with regular expressions, and normally you can kind of like cheese hack your way to parsing things with a regular expression, right? We're just like, there's an inherent assumption about the structure of this thing that allows me to parse it. Really, for like dumb parsing jobs, you can get away with parsing 
a lot of things with a reg -ins. Like, it's just like, I want to capture this thing and I want to capture this thing, blah, 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 blah. This thing is going to be one or more zero through nines. Okay, the takeaway from 355, of course, is that you cannot parse arbitrary C, for example, or arbitrary, most programming languages, you cannot parse with a regex, right? If I give you this right here, turns out this cannot be parsed with regex, ish. Right. If you want to be able to extract like arbitrary, um, I mean it's like clear with C, so we'll, it's also true with Python. But we'll do C real quick, and uh, we'll just do this. Uh, we write something like int main print hello world. If my, the question I want to ask is, I will have a program and it's going to print something. I can swap this with like A to Z, A to Z, whatever I'm willing to argue is the only thing is that's going to be there. And I know that that's true. And I know every program I want to parse is going to be like this. And the thing I want to take away from extracting is every program that looks something like this, it's going to print something. All right, I can use a regex to capture that. If my question I want to ask is I want to extract all functions, right? I can't do that. So for example, if I have function A and it returns 42, I can't just, there's no regular expression I can write to parse all functions and pull out all function bodies, for example. The reason for that is that what you would need to be looking for is something if you were to write it as like a regular expression. So you'd be looking for like backslash this, backslash this, like almost anything, right? But then it would break if we had if one, return 17 or whatever, right? Because then you would be parsing um, until we get to here, you would get to here, and suddenly you'd pull this out as what you parsed, right? Because you're just looking for the first one of these guys, and you didn't actually parse it. And this is where, you know, context-free grammars come in. Turns out a context-free grammar can parse something like this because we get this little stack thing and we can count the number of curly braces, blah, 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 blah. This is the whole world of 355. Yeah, so it's, okay, so you, if you want to parse arbitrary things, depends what you're trying to pull. Long story short, regex is very powerful for parsing lots of things. If you know the structure, the structure is very simple, and you're really asking the question of extract simple little thing out of there, okay? This is just true. Regex is very powerful. If you want to properly parse arbitrary function bodies from C, right, and extract this, turns out regex is not going to be powerful enough for this unless you can make some strong assertions about the style of what's going on here. But in the general case, a, a regular expression will not work. Um, but a context-free grammar would. Uh, and then, of course, there's Turing machines, blah, 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 blah. Okay, cool. Um, anyways, long story short, random parsing jobs in Python, just use a regular expression, probably. 9.99999 times out of 10 that you're doing parsing, you're going to get away with the regular expression. And if you're not, you know that you're not going to get away with it because you're writing something more complicated. So use regular expressions. Cool. All right. Any final questions? It'd be cool to write like a Pwn College style 355. Wow. That would be complicated though because the whole idea is it's a theory class. The whole idea of Pwn College is very applied. But it would be fun to figure that out. How uh, to teach theoretical stuff from an applied perspective. Think about that. Um, all right. One obstacle I ran into while implementing this was dealing with empty categories. Can you deal with that test case? Oh, let's see. Does my parsing... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at this. Okay. Uh, re dot match. Let's go to one where we don't have this. Yes, yeah, so look at something like this. Oh, well, we lost our good line. Hmm. 
I'm just gonna grab this thing and break out of the loop real quick and hope that it's a right. This is not the way to do this, but it'll work, maybe. Right, okay, so we got a line. Read match, this is terrible all zoomed in. Some of these things just do not lend themselves to being super zoomed in. It's probably harder to read in some ways, or in a lot of ways. Wait, where the heck is my rematch? There, okay. This, okay, so this works great. Your concern though that I just saw was, what if it's an empty group? So for example, What's our line? So we'll say line equals this so that we can mess around with that. Okay. And then we'll say, I wanna get this all into one block. Also, if you're ever wondering how am I like getting multi-line stuff going in IPython, I'm hitting control O. So control O is what I just hit right there. And if I wanted more stuff rather than, like, I can't just hit enter, otherwise it'll run it, I can hit control O and just start getting lots of lines. Very fun way to do this uh, interactively without writing a script and just like quickly edit stuff and hit control R to reverse history search, control K at the beginning of the line to cut the whole line into your clipboard, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so your concern that I saw here was empty group. And I'm assuming it's either gonna look like this or this. I think if there's a space in there, this is gonna parse fine. Yeah, see it parsed fine. Um, ish, I don't know, maybe we're having, as you could imagine what happens if I split it like this. Well, that's not gonna work. So really what we should do is before you split it, make sure you dot strip it to remove all white space. Well, that still is an empty thing. I don't know, you could check to see if category levels is quote space quote and just special case that or something. Um, just another if. Uh, I think the regex will probably fail though for this because I said one or more. Yeah, see this fails, which is probably what you're talking about. But the reason it fails is that I said I wanted one or more things, right? Plus means one or more. If we want zero or more, uh, we can do that actually pretty easily. Instead of a plus, we do a star. So star means zero or more, plus means one or more, now we're good to go. You'll see this thing came out as a empty string. Again, you would special case for that because it looks like, unfortunately, it would be cool for us if this just turned into, um, into like an empty list or something, but this turns into a list of an empty string rather than just an empty list. That's just what Python does. Sorry, too bad, deal with it. Uh, we could also do, though, um, set blah, 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 where was that? Something like this, right? Subject category. Uh, we were doing this. And if you're unlucky enough that this is what happens, you could say also if E. And that'll give you your empty set because this will check if the thing in here is truthy and an empty string is falsy. So you could add a little if e here. Uh, this will not work though if it came out like this because that is that. We could say if e and e does not equal that if you want to special case that, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, just special case it. Um, I think we'll probably reach out at the end of the semester to see who wants to become EAs for 365. The past. Probably it'll be our requirement also for next semester. It's a basic requirement is you have an A plus in the class. And ideally also you're active on the Discord. Um, and you're already helpful on the Discord, then we're like, we're excited to have you as a TA. A plus active Discord, good to go. Okay, I also learned the hard way that empty set is set. Yeah, exactly. That's a, it makes sense because dictionaries are way more common than sets, but this, is equal to dict. It is not equal to sets. These are separate things. This, uh, I can't do a dot add 42, but if this was a set, I can add 42. 
Also, if you never knew, you could do semicolons in Python. How fun is that? You could say, print, hello world. Print, this is cool. And now I got semicolons in my language. How fun is that? All right, any final questions? Otherwise, we are rapidly wrapping this up. Hopefully, you enjoyed this module. It's nice and easy. That's why it's a quick turnaround on this one. Because the Unix discretionary access control model is nice and simple. And it's very good when your access control model is simple to wrap your head around. Uh, so, for example, all this craziness that we're doing with like this top secret and these categories. As soon as your access control model gets complicated, you get more capabilities, sure. But then it's going to be harder to implement. It's a lot, the Unix model just makes sense. Hard to mess it up. All right, I am going to end this office hours. Thank you all for joining. Good luck on the module. Remember, it's due very quickly. Due in refresh. Two days, 11 hours, 32 minutes. You got this. This is a relatively easy module. Maybe only easier module is talking web. Maybe you'll even say this is easier than talking web. All right. Thank you all and goodbye.